Hey, good morning, everybody. It's wonderful to be with you all here today again as we uh, face another uh, lockdown. Uh, your face has become more and more valuable to me. Um, I uh, want to start out just uh, by telling you that um, you all are troubled enough. And so my, uh, my words today are meant to bring you hope instead of panic. And I feel like you all should, should, could use some of that today. So let's start off there. Um, the one thing I don't like about Zoom is uh, Zoom worship is that when I preach, I usually like to get a lot of uh, audience feedback. I, I elicit responses from you all. And today I'm gonna do just a little bit of that. In fact, I, I, I don't care if you raise your hand or if you chat me up in the chat box, um, but I wanna know which of you, uh, there, there's basically two kinds of people that I wanna separate in today's world. Um, people that like to work with their hands and people who like to work with their, with their heads. And there's no wrong answer. There, there's two, these two kinds of people. I know what kind of person I am, and I'm gonna share that with you in a few moments. But if you like to work with your hands, why don't you raise your hand or, or chat, okay? And if you would rather work with your head, raise your hand or chat, okay? A lot of those people. Well, um, I'm a head person. Uh, there's some things I can do with my hands out of necessity because doing things with your hands saves a whole lot of money when you're uh, doing home improvement projects. But these soft hands would much rather be working on my keyboard or shaking your hands than uh, raking or hammering or cutting or just about anything. I despise physical labor. I like exercise, but I'm not a big fan of physical labor. And particularly, there is one kind of physical labor that I loathe, and that is gardening. My mother is laughing her head off right now because she has a green thumb and she had me weeding her garden when I was 15 years old. And my grandmother, God rest her soul, had me mowing her lawn at the same age and I would mow down anything that was in my path. I didn't care what it was, just gardening is loathsome to me. And so when I rented um, an apartment, not a, an apartment, but a house in a, uh, in, uh, where were we? Iowa, Carrie. When we lived in Iowa, anybody who's lived there in the Midwest, they know that the, the winters are harsh, uh, but the summers uh, are basically like the Amazon rainforest, uh, it for, but for only like four or five months at a time. So everything grows incredibly fast in Iowa, and the stores could not keep Roundup in stock fast enough for me to use it. It wasn't only until later that I learned, you know, Roundup is like a carcinogen and a terrible thing to use in great quantities on your garden. But I used to go through gallons a week because I would rather have a dead lawn than a, an overgrowing lawn. Everybody's laughing. That's good. That's supposed to be funny. But it's also a little bit serious um, because it's going to relate to the scripture that I'm going to read to you today. I'm going to read you two scriptures that uh, I want you to compare with another. Both of them are from Matthew. Okay, the first one, and this is the scripture that today's uh, theme is based upon, called um, uh, Whole Life Stewardship. This particular parable is the parable of the talents, and it is only found in the book of Matthew. And it is found in Matthew 25, uh, 14 through 28. For if it is a man going on a journey... For, for there was a man going on a journey. He summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one, he gave five talents, and to another, two talents, and to another one, one, according to their ability. Then he went away. The one who had received five talents went away off at, at once and traded them and made five more. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents, but the one who had received only one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. And the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more along, saying, Master, and handed him over to the five, handed him over the five talents. 
See, I have made you five more talents. His master said, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You've been fit, trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. The one who had two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed me two talents. See, I've made you two more. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been entrusted with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received one came forward saying, Master, I, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering things where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I don't sow and gather where I do not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on return I would have received what is mine with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the man with ten talents. Now, there's a comparable uh, parable also in the book of Matthew, and this one is the parable of the sower. I want to read this one to you so we can compare them. This one's taken from Matthew 18, 1 through 8. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat behind the sea. Such great crowds were gathered about him that he had to get in a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach and could hear him. And he told them so many parables, saying, listen. A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them. Others fell on rocky soil, where they did not have much uh, soil, and they sprang up quickly, since there was no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had not root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on the good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some 60 and some 30. Okay. What is the same in these two scriptures? The first thing is that not everybody in both parables is successful. One slave went out with a talent is similar to the seeds that did not sprout or that were choked out by the weeds or burned out by the sun. And both define success in similar ways, as in multiplying. The success of the seeds uh, yield by multipliers of 30, 60, and 100. And the success of the slaves in the talents parable yielded a multiplier of two. But in both regards, they were fruitful. They multiplied. Their lives were magnified by their work that they did for God. What is different <clears throat> in the two scriptures. Well, one is agrarian and one is financial. Finally, when I see the parable of the talents, I think, wow, there's a parable I can understand. You see, the two parables are nearly identical in their message. It's just that one was written for farmers and the other was written for bankers and tax collectors like Matthew was himself. And you can see that the parable of the talents was written to bankers and tax collectors because of the large amount of money that he's talking about here. One talent of silver was equivalent to a laborer's wage for 15 years. If you take that to, to, and apply it to today's minimum wage, then one talent equals approximately $420,000. If a common farmer of this time period, or somebody like me who hates farming, was given five talent, was given five talents, somebody, I'm sorry, if you gave that to somebody who likes to work with their hands in the mud in the garden, and you gave them $2.1 million to steward over, they would have no idea what to do with it. Much of that would happen if my master were to give me seeds and tell me what to do with them and turn them into fruit. I wouldn't know what to do with a bag full of seeds. I had a cactus in my room when I was growing up and it died because I couldn't remember to water it. But silver, here's something that I can get behind. 
here's something that I know how to make work. In fact, I think I'm pretty good at it. So what is this scripture about? It's about being productive for the sake of God. It's about making the world a better place using the gifts and interests that you were born with and have developed over time. Since I was little, um, I started to define my life by like what I wanted to do with accomplish in my life, my years on earth. And the best thing that I could come up with is uh, that I wanted to make the world incrementally better. I never saw myself as somebody who could make a huge leap for mankind, for humankind. But I did know that I could be consistent and that I could work a little bit every day so that when I leave the world, it's maybe this much better than it was the day that I arrived. And that remains my goal to this day. I have two people that I want to give you as examples of good disciples. And these two people are meant to represent the majority of who I think you are out there listening to me today. The first was a man who was a good man who didn't know if he had made the world a better place. He questioned whether or not he was being effective. The second one is about a bad man who ended up making the world a better, split, a better place anyway, but didn't know about it. So one knew he was good, but didn't know if he was effective. One was effective, but didn't know he was good. And it's those two people that I want to tell you about today. Since both are actually, I think, good examples of discipleship, I'm not going to hide their names. The first one that I'd like to use is Noel King. Some of you may know him. Uh, he was an evangelist at that time known as a patriarch in the congregation where I grew up. To me, he was a giant of a spiritual leader. Um, I used to go to uh, prayer meetings on Wednesday nights and listen to Noel speak because when, I, when he spoke, to me, they sounded like what I like to call, quote unquote, Holy Ghost stories. And I loved them. Every single one of them that I heard from him, I cherished. And uh, when it came for me, time to go out on my own as an adult, um, I would listen to him very carefully because as an evangelist, I wanted some direction. And one day, Noel uh, sent me a, a letter. And, and in that letter, it told me, whatever direction you choose, God will be there to bless the path. That it doesn't matter if you go far in the world, go visit different countries and speak to thousands or choose to stay and raise a family, both paths are blessed. It was so comforting to me and made such a difference in my life that I could not believe that uh, when I saw this man that he questioned whether or not he had done anything to make the world a better place. Because in my life, Noel made a huge difference. I don't know if he knew that, but I wish that I would have had a chance to tell him before he died. The second example uh, is a, a man that you probably don't know, and his name was Matt Sipp. Matt was a hardcore drug addict who was making an effort to be clean, one of many in his life. And I met Matt while I was mopping the floors of uh, the church in which I pastored in Iowa. He wanted somebody to talk to, and so he asked if he could come in. I let him in, and, and uh, he said, you're the pastor, right? And I said, yeah, I'm the pastor. He says, why are you mopping the floors then? And I said to him, well, in our church, we make some people speak who aren't the pastor, so I feel like it's their, their right to insist that I clean the floors sometimes. And we had a long talk uh, about uh, his sobriety and his trouble. And he was a, a schizophrenic, paranoid schizophrenic. And when he was on his medications, he'd keep that at bay. But that was really the source of you know, his drug abuse. And he would self-medicate self to try to avoid his demons. Matt uh, came into the church and stayed sober for a good time. Uh, 
we met from time to time, had lunch, and one day I told him about a healing worship that we were going to do um, at the church. And healing worship, uh, for, you may have different names for them, but a healing worship at this particular church meant that we were going to have four different centers during the worship service where people could go and they could ask for a prayer of administration, a prayer for healing. And I told him about him, and he says, I'm not going to miss that. In fact, I'm going to bring my girlfriend to it, too. So uh, he came, um, he brought his girlfriend, and his girlfriend brought her, her two sons. And um, when it came time for that worship, he, he for that prayer of administration, he came over, and um, he's, you know, he, it was his time, and I already knew he would be coming to me. So I, I gave the, the prayer of confirmation because I knew about his life. And uh, he went back and he sat down. About five minutes later, after one or two more prayers, his girlfriend came up to us and said, in tear-soaked um, speech so that we could barely hear her, I want that too. And that's all she could say. And I never met this woman before. I don't know what she needed in her life, but... We prayed for her, and she went and sat back down, and that was what I thought was the end of it. Well, as time went by, Matt relapsed and left, uh, left his girlfriend, left the state. In fact, the last time I heard from him, he was in Alabama, and he called me asking for money. I said, no, can't do that for you. But his girlfriend and sons kept coming to church and, in fact, seemingly through that prayer had found what they needed and all three of them were baptized and became members of our church and went on to become disciples of Christ. Well, I like to use Matt as an example of a servant who invested those talents because he was only sober for three months, and in those three months was able to bring three people to Christ. If you who are sober and successful can't do that, how is it that he did? So you can be a servant like Noel, who invests his money without knowing it, and receiving fruit, or you can be a man like Matt, who knew he was investing, but didn't think he'd ever get anything back. But either one, you have the possibility of becoming a disciple of Christ. Both were successful servants in using their gifts to make God's world a better place, because it was their willingness to risk that made them good disciples. That's what they have in common. And that's what you all have in common, too, your ability to risk and to do something good for God. So it's my practice near the end of sermons that I give. I like to give you homework. I like to give you something to do, some practical way to live out this message that I'm giving you. And uh, so today I'm going to give you something that you can consider to be a spiritual practice. And it's something that you can do now. Uh, before we gather next week. And this time I want you to risk a little bit. I want you to scroll through your phone. In my phone, I've got hundreds and hundreds of contacts, some of whom I haven't seen or talked to in 10 years, and some of whom I, I text regularly. Or if you don't have a phone, you like to use paper. You know, you archaic people who still write on paper. It's crazy, right? This stuff that you can, this pen, you know, you can use this. And you, if you have an address book, I'd like you to flip through that address book and identify somebody. I'd like you to write to them like Noel used to write to me. And here's what I want you to say to them. I'm going to start the letter for you. I want you to say, Adam, I'm using Adam because he was first. Adam, I've been thinking of you lately. And I think God wants you to know dot, dot, dot. But yes, I literally want you to say, I think God wants you to know. It can be a note of great appreciation. It can be a note of guidance or of comfort. Comfort. 
people need this kind of connection in order to grow and be fruitful. You'll never know how much you affect somebody until you try it. And I want you to trust me. Do it and you'll see. Maybe I'm wrong. But I think I'm right. Let this be one way that your life can bear fruit when you cannot get together and hug one another and cry with one another and pray for one another in person. And the last thing that I'd like you to do at the end of this sermon, most of my sermons, is to offer you a blessing. And today, this is what I want to say. May God bless you. And may you live your whole life in the service of God. If you're a farmer, may you farm for God. If you're a banker, may you bank for God. If you're a parent or a student or a teacher, may you guide, learn, and instruct for God. If you're a protector, may you protect for God. May you use your gifts, whatever they may be, and yes, your talents to serve God this week and for all weeks to come. Amen.